last week we talked about, what did we talk about? That's right, gossip. Okay, you got it. So I have a great and juicy story for you today. No, just kidding. That's gossip. Okay, so, but today we're going to talk about my next favorite thing to talk about, and that's complaining. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue is the power of life and death. And those who love it will eat the fruit. So we talked about <laughs> gossip. Uh, but this week we're going to talk about probably one of the number one ways we uh, destroy people around us with our mouths, okay? And um, that's why we've just titled the series My Big Fat Mouth. Someone asked me how long the series was going to last. And I said, we are going to take as long as it takes, even if it takes four, five years, we're just going to go for it. No, actually, this is our last one. This is a mini-series. Next week, we're going to start our fall series on money. That's right, and it's, it's titled Nine Steps to Financial Freedom. And so why are we doing it this fall? Let me tell you a couple realities here uh, in 2022. Eight out of ten families live paycheck to paycheck. Eight out of ten in our country. So if I were to look here, I, maybe that's us, 80% of us. 54% of Americans don't even have $1,000 in their savings. The average family spends $500 more a month than they make. How do they do that? How can you spend $500 more than you make? Da -da -da -da. That's right, plastic, the magic plastic thing. Do you know that financial pressure is the number two cause of divorce? Yes. It used to be the number one, now it slid to number two. If you want to know what the number one cause of divorce is, uh, next February we're going to be <laughs> doing a marriage series, we're going to hit it big. Anyway, and it's actually one of the top five reasons for suicide, financial stress. Uh, Americans now have $856 billion in credit card debts and less than $65,000 in their retirement accounts. That's the average American. You know, and, and you know, people say, well, Pastor, money's not spiritual. Well, here's the answer to number one on the back of your notes. It, this is the answer to number one. The truth is, having more to give to others and to take care of your family is spiritual. It is. How do I know that? 1 Timothy 5.8 says, If anyone does not provide for his own, especially those of his own household, he has denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. How many of you know it's hard to have peace when you have financial needs? Even when your wife is beautiful, she doesn't look as good when you don't have any money for your honey. Am I right? That's right. Life requires money. How many of you know that? When, when your mortgage or rent is due, they don't want prayer from you. Am I right? They want money. Okay? And if you've lived without enough, most of people that I know, they run after money. It consumes their every thought and it steals our peace. So what do we do? Most Americans turn to debt. That's our answer, and that causes us to give up on our dreams. We don't like our job, but we can't quit. Why? Because of debt. That's not how God designed us to live. It's not too late to give your life a fresh start, regardless of your age, and begin to prosper using God's principles. This series is one of the best series I've ever... It's better than Dave Ramsey. It starts off Dave Ramsey-esque, where it talks about budgeting and credit cards and debt. Yes, it does. Because the Bible says if we can't, we can't, um, if we, if we can't manage earthly wealth, God will never trust us with true riches. So we need to get our act together with what we have, okay, for sure. Because, you know, God is looking at us, what we do with the little things, how we spend our money, God looks at, and if we do it well, the Bible says if we manage the worthly things well, God will give us bigger things, better things. He'll promote us in life. So, but this series is more than just budgeting, okay? Budgeting alone will only take you so far. This gives practical but supernatural steps to find hidden money. I'm telling you, hidden money in your life and give you supernatural ideas for new streams of income and get out of debt. It all starts next week at our picnic, okay? We'll start there. But after the picnic, once a year, we ask everybody in church to get into small groups or what we call connect groups okay each connect group they'll have a little video that will amplify what we talked on Sunday you'll have this discussion book and when you get to your when you actually show up the small group you get one if you're a couple you get one per couple because you want to work on it together this book cost me $25 for each one that you get I'm not charging you I want you to go to the small group so much I we our church we bought them for you okay 
So we are a good church. We want to help you. And don't forget, it's not like we're in the, amen, well, thank you. We're not in the midst of what I would call an economic uh, revival. We are, we are perhaps moving not just into recession, but we could see a worldwide depression in a couple of years. Seriously. So what we do now is key, okay? Some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm the best person I know with finances. Well, good. Come to the small group, get better, or this will give you ideas. I'm telling you, this, this will be the best thing that's ever happened to you. Now, I ask everybody here to get in the small group. We already, Oliver and Marla's group is already filled, but we have uh, Dwayne, Dwayne and Hilda. Now, we, we have the sign up right out at the info desk. You can also sign up on your... Your, yeah, on your church app. But we have sign-up group, Dwayne and Hilda. They live about three blocks from the Mount Vernon Hospital. And uh, then we have Grover and April. Grover and April. Would you stand up, Grover and April? Grover and April, they have an amazing house. They live a little closer to Rose Hill. So it's a little further out, but they have an, they'll have an amazing group too. We're trying to fill those two groups today, okay? So if you're not in a group, I'm challenging you, get into one of those groups, and we're going to have an amazing time. I believe a life-changing time. We'll talk about it on Sunday. We'll talk about it in small groups. And listen, if you're saying, well, pastor, I don't know anybody. I don't have any friends. Hey, get in the connect group. You'll meet friends. You'll laugh. You'll have a great time. It will be life-changing. Amen. All right. Did everybody get that? That's right. Thank you. And so please sign up after this, okay? And uh, I want to also mention one last thing. Uh, next week, we will not be here. I know it already said it three times. And it's in your bulletin. In your bulletins are directions to Fort Hunt Park. We're in the, we are in the first pavilion, A1, the biggest one. We'll, we'll, you'll hear the music as you're coming in. We have our own parking lot. We're going to have our own volleyball. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have lots of food. But I want you to know we're not starting at 10. We're giving you an extra hour of sleep. We are actually starting at 11, okay? So, so if you come early, we'll put you to work. Please come early, <laughs> early anyway. But anyway, so next week. Look at your neighbor and say, next week we won't be here. That's right. You'll think the Lord has already come. When you come if you come here next Sunday, we won't be here, okay? Amen. Well, that was the preamble. Let me get into the message. How many of you are hungry for God's word? I am hungry today for God's word. Okay, so we're going to be talking about one of America's greatest sports and pastimes. No, I'm not talking about football. I'm talking about complaining. That's right, that's really what we do more than apple pie, baseball, and football. We love to complain, am I right? <laughs> am I only talking to myself today? Yo, oh, no, I know I'm talking to you. So the first example we have of complaining in the Bible is with the children of Israel. Now, God has just rescued them out of Egypt. They were slaves for hundreds of years. Catch, catch this, hundreds of years. God sets them free from slavery. All the Egyptian neighbors fill them with their silver and gold. He destroys Egypt's armies. They see supernatural miracles. They walk through the Red Sea. God, they're in the middle of the desert. God puts a cloud at night and fire, no, a cloud during the day to keep them cool, a pillar of fire at night to keep them warm. R water gushes out of rocks. It rains food every day. And guess what? They complain. That's right. They complain 10 times so that God said, I will not take this generation into the promised land. They lost it because they complained. Now, let's turn to Exodus chapter 14, verse 11 and 12. It says, they said to Moses, was... Be <laughs> this, I can't even say this with a straight face. They said, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't, you say, didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Let us serve... The let's, let's be slaves. Well, didn't we tell you we'd rather be slaves than be free? It would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Oh, my goodness. They complained. Am I right? <clears throat> now, let me show you a shocking thing. That was a, a, in Exodus chapter 16. Moses said something that should be a slap in our face. You're not grumbling against us. You're grumbling against the Lord. Can you imagine? And this is a fill in the blank. Imagine that if every time you complained, it's not about your circumstances. It's not about the traffic. It's not about another person. But what if in God's eyes, when we're complaining, we're really complaining about him? Wow. So that's maybe how God sees it. Because he's our father. He's our provider. 
So let's personalize this message today. So I'm going to ask everyone the question, do not have to say it out loud, but what is the thing that you complain about most? And I want you, I even put a fill in the blank there. I complain about blank the most. Take a minute, figure it out. And if you don't know, ask your wife or husband next to you because they'll know. Am I right? Isn't that how that works? I already know what I complain about most. I thought about it. Uh, I complain about having to do other people's jobs at my house. Am I the only one that has to do that? I can't believe I have to do this. So-and-so was supposed to do this. I can't believe you asked me. This is someone else's job. Anyway, that's what I complain about all the time. So, you know, some of us complain that we're not married. Others complain that we are married. Am I right? <laughs> or you complain about your spouse. You complain that money's tight. Or the house is too small. Or your boss drives you crazy. Or meetings are boring. Or smaller, we, we complain about the weather. The Wi-Fi is slow. There's nothing to watch on TV. We complain about the president. doesn't matter which president it is. Every president, someone's complaining. We complain about Congress. We complain about taxes. Did you know I had to, that they bumped my taxes up in Fairfax County $150 more a month? $150 more a month. See, here I am complaining again. But anyway, <laughs> why do we complain so much? One of the reasons, here's a fill in the blank, guys. Here's one of the reasons why we complain it's because we've taken our eyes off the goodness of God and our focus is on ourselves. We're not focusing on the goodness of God, we're focusing on ourselves. Psalm 27, 13, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let me give you Steve's translation. I would have complained unless I believed that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Hello? Hello? We're going to look at Paul the Apostle. Now, if you know anything about Paul the Apostle, of course, he wrote most of the New Testament. He started more churches in the first century probably than anyone else. He had assembled a great team to help him too. But what's fascinating about Paul is that he did not, leave a, he did not live a comfortable life. If you look in Corinthians, he goes about all the things that have happened to him. I mean, now, if you know anything about, if you look in his letters, he, his greatest desire... Paul kept, when he first started churches, he started in small, small cities. But then he got the idea, no, I'm going to go to the bigger cities. His church that he started in Ephesus, Ephesus was the second largest city in the Roman world at that time. And, and he started a city in Corinth, which is also a large city. He, he, he wanted to go to Rome. He wanted to preach in Rome. He thought, if I can only preach the gospel in Rome, what could we influence? You know, And I understand him there. Uh, that because he felt that he could impact the whole world. But do you know what? When Paul finally went to Rome, he didn't go there to preach. He went as a prisoner. He wasn't just any prisoner, but he was locked up for two years, 24 hours a day. He was chained to a different Roman guard. They, they had eight-hour shifts. He was chained to a different guard every eight hours for, for two years. And guess what? He had the biggest chance that he wasn't going to be acquitted, the biggest chance was that Caesar was just going to say, Psh, let's cut his head off. So he's waiting for two years. He didn't know how long he's going to wait because they don't get, you know, there was no like, like we have laws, you can only be so much before trial. There were no laws like that for them. Do you think Paul had a reason to complain? Oh, he sure did. It's not like complaining that the food's five minutes late when we go to a restaurant, am I right? No, if anyone had a reason to complain, Paul could have. Do you know what, what his prayer could have been like? God, why are you allowing this to happen to me? I've been faithful to you. <laughs> I've been shipwrecked. I've been beaten. I've been snake bitten. I've been left for dead. All I've done is serve you. And you know how strategic this city is. I can make such a difference here, but here I am locked up. I'm a prisoner. The floor is hard. The food is bad. The Roman soldier doesn't use deodorant. He stinks. But instead of complaining in this very situation he writes a letter to philippi the church at philippi that's what joseph was talking about in philippians let me go two chapters back from what he shared about the offering in philippians 2 writing next to a stinky roman guard in a roman dungeon not knowing if he's going to live or die this is what the apostle paul says do everything without what's that word complaining, complaining. wow when you put it in context, it makes it so heavy for us who complain about nothing. A few years ago, we took all our youth to the Dominican Republic to plant a church. 
And when they came back, we let them all have a testimony here. They all said the same thing. You know what it was? They have nothing, and they're happy. Mm. Do everything without complaining so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And you know, he's not writing from a cruise ship. He's not writing from a luxury hotel. Wow. He tells the church, do not complain or grumble. Let me give you a practical reason why we shouldn't complain, since I know a lot of you want more practical. There is a book out by a Dr. Travis Bradbury called Emotional Intelligence 2.0. And this guy, he did a field of study on complaining. That's right. And here's what he says in that book. And it's, it's repeated complaining, to fill in the blank, repeated complaining hardwires the brain to what? Complain more. In other words, the more negative you are, the more your brain is going to be triggered to be more negative. How many of you know that's how it works? You started off sour in your high school, and you are a nag today. Am I right? <laughs> but a negative mindset, what does it do? It leads us, he goes into this book, and he says it leads us to what is called a confirmation bias. What that means is when you expect something to be bad, you get what you expect. In other words, people who chronically complain always get what they complain about. Is that you? Are you a chronic complainer? Because the more we complain, the more we hardwire ourselves to complain more. I've heard women say all men are losers, all women or men are jerks. Ladies, have you heard that before? I have heard it. But when that's your preconceived idea, no matter if God sends you a Prince Charming, you're only going to see something bad in him. Am I right? Yeah, that's what happened to the Israelites. The Israelites complained day in and day out about slavery. Now God miraculously re rescues them. All their Egyptian neighbors throw silver, gold, and jewels on them. They go out into the desert, and guess what they do? They keep complaining. Why? Their negative mindset trained them to be even more negative. It's dangerous. Why is it dangerous? Because if you have a negative mindset... You've just set yourself up to only see the bad in life. That's why I got rid of cable, because cable and newspapers reinforce my desire to complain. Am I right? That's all they do on, I mean, it, other than gossip, they complain. Complain about everything. It's not news anymore, it's complaining. But anyway, think about it. The Israelites, they were set free, they had everything. And all they could do was complain. Don't let that be you. So let's go back to the Apostle Paul. I think we can learn something from this guy because in the hardest possible circumstances, he didn't complain. So let me tell you two mindsets that you need to have that will enable you to thrive, to be grateful no matter what your circumstances are. Mindset number one, fill in the blank. If you can change your circumstances, if there's something negative in your life and you can do something about it, do something about it. Hello? Do something about it. 1 Corinthians 7, 21, Paul's talking to the church there. Were you a slave when you, were, when you heard the call to receive Christ? Don't let that worry you, though. If you can find an opportunity to become free, take it. If there's something you can do about your situation, do it. You don't like your job? Get another one. Don't like what they're paying you? Go back to school. Get some more, uh, of, of some, some more, um, more education, but certifications. You can always do something different. I knew a guy that he was so miserable in life at 50. He said, that's it. I'm quitting what I'm doing. He went to medical school at 50. 50. He retired the most, one of the most richest doctors in Tampa because when he graduated, not only was he a great doctor, he founded a hospital. When, when he retired at 70-something, he sold his hospital for millions of dollars. He was able to change his life because he decided that I can change my circumstances. I love what it says in Romans 12. If it, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. If you can do something about it, do something about it. If, as far as it depends on you, you can change your circumstance. But what we don't go, do is go through life and pretend that everything's okay when it's not. You know, it, it's a sin to notice when some... It's not a sin, excuse me. Not a sin to notice when something's not right in your life. Am I right? Something wrong in your marriage. It, it's, it's a sin to complain about it and never do anything to change it. 
So don't complain about it. Don't put comments on social media. We used to have a lady in our church. She moved on. I knew all, every fight she ever had with her husband because she'd put it on Facebook. Every time she had an issue, she put it on Facebook. And I thought, why is she doing this to herself? <laughs> I'm just saying. Mindset number two is if you can't change your circumstance, mindset number one, if you can change it, change it. But if you can't, then change your perspective. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm telling you, if you just had God's eyes looking at your situation, you'd see it differently. Change how you think about it. Change how you see the circumstances. Now, now Paul is chained up 24 hours a day, every eight hours to a different one. Why, couldn't, why did he not complain? He couldn't change his circumstances, but he could change his perspective. Notice what Paul said just one verse after he said, don't complain. This is what he said, Philippians 2, 17. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad I rejoice with all of you. Now, wait a minute. Paul's saying here that his life is like a drink offering, right after telling the church not to complain. So we do not have an offering and sacrifice culture. Am I right? When we sin, we don't have to go to Jerusalem and get a lamb. And, and Am I right? We don't do that anymore. Am I right? So what, when he says something like this, we don't understand the impact of it because that's not part of our culture. We don't have to cough up an animal every time we sin. Can you imagine every time you broke the speed limit, you had to go somewhere and offer a, a, an animal sacrifice right there, and they, they throw the blood on you after you go. Can you imagine paying your ticket like that? Woo! Anyway, but what was a drink offering? When you did something as a sin and you offered a sin offering, often the person says, God, I love you so much. I'm going to add to that offering. I'm going to put a drink offering. I'm going to offer. It was a way to show your love and appreciation to God. You gave the most expensive liquid you had. Sometimes it was a wine. Sometimes it was honey. Honey in their culture was very rare, much more expensive. The drink offering, when it was poured out on top of the animal being sacrificed, it changed the aroma. Now, I love barbecues, but when you put like a, when you put like a special... Uh, See, you know what I'm talking about? When you put something on that, mmm, I'm telling you, you put honey barbecue, doesn't that change the smell? But Paul, well, here's what Paul was saying. His daily life, he wanted it to be a sweet-smelling sacrifice to God. Instead of complaining about it, he said, God, I'm, I'm offering my life. Even the hardest circumstance of my life, I'm offering it up to you, up to you as a, a sweet-smelling sacrifice. And look at that in the context of how miserable he was. Romans 12.1 Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies. Offer your life as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Wow. See, worship isn't just lifting our hands and singing in church on Sunday. No, no. It's offering our life every day, no matter what the circumstances is. Even if I'm chained to a Roman guard in a Roman prison, but it's offering it to God. You know, a few weeks ago... Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Pastor Bill Johnson. He has a church in Northern California. His wife died a few weeks ago. And the Sunday after she passed away, he was there in church. He was there in church to preach. And it was unexpected that she would passed away. But she died. And you could tell when he stood up that he had been weeping for days. He, I saw such a broken man. But you know what he said? He said, I didn't want to miss this opportunity. I said, what opportunity? He said, in heaven, God's going to wipe away all our tears. We're never going to understand what, what uh, uh, pain and sorrow is in heaven. But I didn't want to miss this opportunity out of my great sorrow to give God a sacrifice of praise. How many of you know it's so easy to praise God when your, your, money's full of, uh, uh, your wallet's full of money? When, you're, when you just got that great promotion, when your wife looks like a million dollars, am I right? Or treats you like a million dollars. How many of you know that's easy to worship God? The greatest sacrifice is offering God a sacrifice of worship. The deepest, darkest days of our life. So if you can't change your circumstance, change your perspective. How could Paul in prison chained to a Roman soldier, offer praise and worship to God. Well, let me tell you how he could do it. Paul wasn't the center of his story. Jesus was. 
you know what's so tragic about our culture? How many of you know that we don't take pictures of other people? We all take selfies now. It's, it's, a, it's an emblematic, it's, it's symbolic of our culture. It now revolves around me. We're a me culture. But in Paul's life, Jesus was the center of his story. And because of that, he could take a negative circumstance and change his perspective in a way that would impact what God was able to do through his negative circumstance. You know, it's interesting. You know how Paul looked at it? He said this. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He says that in Philippians. How is this advancing the gospel? He's not complaining. He changes perspective. And then he says, right after that, he says, as a result, it has become clear to the whole palace guard. So he wasn't chained to a Roman guard. There was a guard chained to him for eight hours where he could tell them about Jesus. He cha- and every eight hours they changed the guard, he could tell a different person. By, t- by the time two years had come, many of the palace guard had received Christ. The whole palace guard and their families heard about Jesus because every eight hours they kept feeding him another guard. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm telling you. You think I'm the prisoner here? No, you're stuck to me for the next eight hours and I'm going to tell you about a man, man who changed my life. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You know... When he came to Rome, he was chained to a Roman centurion who, if the ship was going to sink, his duty was to kill Paul with a sword. But by the time the ship ship was about to sink, that centurion was already a Christian because he'd seen so many things in Paul's life. And when Paul said, I had a vision, the Lord spoke to me that you're all going to live, we have to do this and this, the centurion became his servant. I'm telling you. He turned it around. He he couldn't change his circumstance, but he sure changed his perspective. So the question I want to ask you today is, who are you chained to? What are you chained to? Don't say your husband or wife. But you could be in a painful relationship. Maybe you're chained to a job situation. You just don't know what you're going to do. Maybe you're chained to a financial problem. Maybe you're in the middle of a hole you don't know how to get out of. Maybe it's a health issue. and You're stuck with it. The list could go on and on. Let me say this to you. If you can do something about it, do something about it. If you can pray, pray. If you can work, work. If you can get counseling, get counseling. If you need help, seek help. If you can get wisdom, get wisdom. If you can turn over a new leaf, yes, even old dogs can turn over new leaves and and learn some new tricks with Jesus inside them. Am I right? But if you can't do anything about it, change your perspective. This could be the greatest thing that ever happened to you, like it was for Paul. Because not only, he didn't just, he didn't, see, when he usually went in the city, he taught, he went to the Jews and then to the God-fearing, they were called God-fearing Greeks, they had a a synagogue next to the synagogue where Greeks were not allowed to go or the Romans weren't allowed to go, but he would spend his time with them. But instead, God put him straight into the palace and he got to testify to the palace guard and all the people that worked in the palace. God put him in a higher position because he changed his perspective. He didn't say, man, I'm stuck here. I can't do anything. No. He said, oh, you guys are stuck with me. We're going to change this palace for Jesus. And he did. Amen. Amen. Okay. So rather than complaining about something you can, cannot change, seek God's presence, his power in the middle of something you never would have asked for. So let me end with, I just want to end with one thought. I know I'm a little over, I, let me just take two more minutes. After my last message on gossip, I get a call from Tyler over there and he says, hey, pastor, um, when I have an issue at work with somebody and I don't tell my wife, if I tell my wife, is that considered gossip? And I said, hmm, Tyler, that's a great question. Boy, I wish you had a smarter pastor who would know the answer to that one. No, but anyway, so, so if you're married, Do you have the right to complain to your spouse? Let me just take two minutes to talk about that. And let me say the number one thing. Dysfunctional families, the fill in the blank, do not allow each other to be honest with each other. So if you can't tell your heart, even if it's a complaining heart, if you can't even say it to your spouse, something's wrong. Because silence and secret keeping, those are the key features of a dysfunctional family. You know, many couples, when they come in for counseling, they have have many problems. But in most cases, they never talk about their problems. So in order to be honest with each other, and this is another fill in the blank, you have to extend your spouse the right to complain. I'm going to say that again. In order 
to be honest with each other, we have to extend to our spouse the right to complain. And when I talk with people and they have issues in their marriage, they say, well, I could never share this with my, my husband or I could never share this with my wife. They just get crazy and explode. In bad marriages, spouses don't have the right to complain. In good marriages, here's the thought that I have. I'm here to satisfy you. I'm here to meet your needs. Therefore, if I'm not doing something right, I want to know about it. Am I right? Women, I know women, you think men can read your mind. We don't. You could be mad as hornets about us, and we could be totally oblivious. We could think it's, we're, do, we're having the best year we possibly could have, and she's already talking to her attorney about getting rid of you. You know what I'm talking about? Because we can't read minds. So I'm saying, you have the right to complain in a godly way. Now I'm going to show you how to do it real quick. Ephesians 4, here's what it says. Therefore each of you must put off falsehood, speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on you while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Let me just give you a couple of things. Here's a fill in the blank. Here's a fill in the blank. First step is to be careful and gentle in the way that you deal with your emotions and problems. Be careful and gentle. So God says in your anger, do not sin. How many of you know we, uh, we do sin when we get angry? We have a saying in America, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. How many of you have heard that one? That's a lie. Words hurt a lot more than sticks and stones. Am I right? They hurt a lot deeper. Dr. John Gottman, University of Washington, he spent 20 years studying people fighting and arguing. He had a, an apartment. He'd put couples in every weekend, and he'd listen to them. He found that your conversation will never rise above the first three minutes. That means that if your first three minutes are negative, yelling, anger, negative threats, no matter how long you talk, it'll never get better. So what's, even if you say nice things at the end, it doesn't change the tone. So what happens if your conversation starts off negative, end the conversation, pick it up later. Did you hear me? End the conversation, pick it up later. Say, I'm an idiot, please. Let's talk in about an hour, okay? That, that's the best way that I do. The second thing, the second step is point the finger at yourself. Instead of saying, you know, you said this to me and you're a terrible person for saying it, you need to say it like this, I want to know, I want you to know how I feel about what you said to me, even though I may be wrong about it. We can complain by saying me. Hey, you said something to me and I may, may not have understood, but it really hurt me and I need to tell you why it hurt me. How many of you know that's important? Godly complaining points the finger at yourself, not the other. I feel rejected. I feel offended. This is the kind of uh, complaining that just tells the other how you're feeling, okay? So it could be the way I was raised. I'm maybe immature. I just don't understand women. But in marriage and family, we need the right to share how we are feeling if we can share it in a godly way. Amen? Amen. So as we come to our prayer time, I believe that God wants to break chains today. Because I believe that we become chronic complainers. You know, I didn't know I was a chronic complainer in the car, but my dad, he, you know, when you're kids, you're, vi you're videotaping everything they say, you're, you're, you know, you've got that video on. My dad constantly complained about traffic and driving, and that was in a city of only 200,000. We didn't even have bad traffic, not like it is here. I didn't realize until I got married that, that I was constantly complaining about the traffic and, my, and the driving when I'm driving until my wife pointed it out. <laughs> hey, I think everybody has something here that we need to be set free from. So we're going to do two things here. We're going to open up the altars because I believe that, but we're going to spend a moment and I'm going to ask God to show us the areas in our life that we need to be set free in. Amen? And then if, if it's really an issue, come forward. Let's, let's, we're, our prayer teams are going to be ready for you. We want to pray for you today because sometimes we need God's help to stop it. Am I right? We need either God's help or it's a potato that sits right in the center of our mouth. But before we do that, I know we've got some visitors today. We've got a lot of new people. I'm so glad you came today. Be welcome in this place. Do not come here next Sunday, though. Come to the, the picnic, okay? We won't be here, okay? But... If you know anything about me, I'm passionate about one thing. I'm passionate about connecting you with the Lord Jesus Christ because he changed my life. So many times in life we think that what, what we need is, well, I'll go to church every so often. I will, uh, I'll pray when I get in trouble. That's not what we need. What you need is a relationship with God and through Jesus. See, when you were made, there's a hole inside you, and we feel it. We try to, 
we try to fill it with all kinds of other stuff. We really do. We try to fill it, guys, we fill it with work, uh, sex. I mean, we have all kinds of things that we try to fill, entertainment. I'm telling you, we try to fill it with all kinds of stuff that doesn't get filled. That's why we saw so many people receive Christ in Bombo when we were in Africa because Islam does not fill the emptiness inside. It just brings a greater rage to, to, to life and more reasons to complain. They saw the joy in the Christians and they knew they didn't have it. That's why we saw so many. I, I, the pastor said that we saw a great number of people come to Christ and he, and he shared how many people came. He were, they were so excited about that. But today, I'm praying for you. You, you, you need to be connected with Jesus. Jesus says, the Bible says in Revelation 3 that he knocks on the door of our life. Do you know why God doesn't do more in our life? You have to invite him in. He's not going to push you to do anything. To as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to be a child of God. See, that's what God's offering us. He's offering to be our father, to be, that we become his child. When we receive Christ, he comes inside us, and everything in Jesus comes in us. It's the most amazing thing. It is so dramatic a change in our life that the Bible calls it being born again. And it beats any religious mumbo jumbo anyone in can say, being born again is it. Am I right? And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. If you are missing something, that's probably what you're missing. You say, well, pastor, I pray, I go to church. Yeah, but you need to be connected to Jesus. Do you know when God made Adam and Eve, what did he do? Every day he walked with them. That's what God wants to do with you. He wants to have a relationship with you. And you know what? Life goes a lot better with him in our lives. So let's close our eyes. Let's pray this prayer out loud. And if you that have been far from God, you that have, you know, tried to fill it with other things, pray this prayer. I'm telling you, Jesus is going to come inside you, and you're going to be a different person. So let's pray this prayer together. Everybody out loud. Dear God, I open my life to you. Jesus, come inside me. Be Lord of my life. I believe that you're the Son of God. Believe that you died for me. Help me live for you. Amen. Spirit of God, fall on every person here today. Amen. Would you look here just for a minute? If you prayed that prayer, something changed inside you. You already know it. At the info desk, I've got a book for you I want to give you. So just go there if you're a new person, first time guest. Fill out the Connect card. We'll give you a, a, a gift there. If you're not in a small group for the next week, get on there right now, the info desk. Please sign up. Now, if you're chained to something, come on. If there's something in your life that you can't break this cycle of complaining, let's just stand up for a minute. We're going to release you right now. I, and as our, our worship team, they're going to sing a song. But as they're singing, I want you to thank God, what can I, what do I need to do? Because we want to pray for you. Our prayer team is going to be right here waiting for you and then that's how kind of we're going to end today go ahead let's let's read one one quick uh chorus i'm in i'm yours your love's too good to leave me here